Welcome everyone to the third Climate Europe webinar. Uh, in the, this webinar, we have two uh, speakers, Vladimir Jutimik uh, from the uh, Serbian Weather Service, uh, who will talk about the, uh, the uh, Virtual Climate Change Center uh, that is hosted in Belgrade. And uh, Tom Felt uh, from Excel Kathleen, uh, who will talk about the uh, use of climate data in the, in the insur insurance industry. Uh, just a reminder about the uh, webinars. The uh, webinars consist in uh, two talks uh, of around 20 minutes that will be followed by uh, a, a number of questions that the attendants will formulate. And uh, at the end of the, uh, after the uh, two presentations, if we have time, we'll go through the uh, uh, two questions that are part of uh, the uh, webinar uh, that uh, will uh, foster, hopefully, some discussion. And uh, the two questions appear here. The uh, challenges for climate modeling and observations to be raised uh, by climate services and uh, the uh, barriers that uh, prevent a faster development of a climate services market. The uh, uh, speakers are invited to uh, address these questions at any point in their presentation. And uh, before giving the floor to Vladimir, uh, I would like to uh, 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 invite everyone to visit the Climate Europe uh, website where you can find uh, the previous webinars and also the announcements of the uh, future ones. So thanks very much for attending and uh, 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 the floor is yours, Vladimir. Uh, one of the main uh, activities is participation in uh, WMO uh, Region Association 6 RCC network, its regional climate centers network. And uh, for the Region 6, there, there is a three main activities led by three different institutions, or, or let's say four. The first one is a collecting of uh, climate data, which is led by uh, Netherlands uh, K uh, KNMI. And then uh, we have the activity on climate monitoring, which is led by DVD in Germany. And uh, finally, long range forecast, which is led by uh, Meteo France and uh, Roshi Vedi from, from uh, Russia. Uh, on the other side, we do a lot of modeling here. We develop uh, several, let's say, modeling uh, systems or modeling uh, frameworks. Uh, mainly re rely on NMMB model. It's a global, but also the regional model. model can be used as a global and regional. It's not non hydrostatic. But we also work on modeling on uh, uh, mineral uh, aerosol transport, then the uh, atmosphere ocean coupling, and also develop the model for hydrology, uh, hydrology modeling on a medium and small scale uh, catchments. Uh, related to the climate monitoring node and activities in climate monitoring within the RCC uh, network, uh, every month we prepare the, let's say, analysis of the previous month in terms of uh, anomalies uh, of uh, key vari surface variables like uh, precipitation and temperature. And we also produce the maps uh, of large scale, scale cir circulation, which are relevant uh, for our climate in this region, let's say like uh, figures for uh, different uh, teleconnection indexes, uh, which are important for this for this region and, and uh, similar similar products. Uh, related to the long range forecast activities within RCC uh, network, uh, we're doing something which is not so common uh, right now in, in around the world. It's a downscaling of the long range forecast. We, we downscale the uh, ECM WF uh, long range forecast using regional coupled model. So we, like uh, 10 years ago, developed here the coupled, uh, regional coupled model, uh, which is combination of the ETA model. ETA model, ETA model was uh, for a long time been a operational uh, NWP model in the United States. And we coupled ETA with the POM. So we use this coupled system for a downscaling of uh, seasonal for forecast for from ECMWF, and we downscaled the whole ensemble of seasonal, seasonal forecast, which consists of 51 ensemble members. So also on the beginning of every month, we produce this downscaling for the seven months ahead of, uh, uh, of seasonal forecast. Also on our website, uh, you can find the products, uh, mainly the anomalies of, the, of these key uh, variables like uh, surface temperature and precipitation, and also you can find some uh, products related to the state of the Mediterranean Sea. 
uh, for the for the next seven months. Uh, one of the interesting activity which uh, also reflects the cooperation in the region and cooperation with the uh, uh, within the RC network is the preparation of climate water advisory advisory for the uh, southeast uh, Europe, and it's also some kind of WMO uh, activity related to the to the climate monitoring and cooperation within the RC network. Uh, also, we participate in two ARCOFs. ARCOFs is a regional uh, climate outlook forum. The main uh, uh, reason why these outlook forums uh, exist is to produce the, uh, let's say, consensus, consensus forecast for the next season. There is a two uh, ARCOFs in which uh, our center participates. One is the Southeast European Climate Outlook Forum, or SICOF, and another one is the METCOF, it's a Mediterranean Climate Outlook Forum, and uh, ARCOFs uh, are organized, let's say, in November and May every year. So the ARC of produce the seasonal consensus forecast for the uh, coming winter and coming summer. And the products of both uh, COFs can be found on, on uh, official WMO page uh, related to the many ARCOFs which are happened every, every uh, six months around the, around the globe. Uh, also, we have some experience, uh, or, or or we try to to produce some uh, uh, added informa information besides the the uh, raw model products related to the long range forecast. So we uh, uh, just for a few, let's say, users or interest uh, uh, parties, try to produce some informations which are uh, more related to the activity in, in, in that sector. Like uh, in, here you can uh, see the example uh, for the agriculture. So from the seasonal forecast, we produce the grape reaping dates, uh, for the, uh, grape wine reaping dates, or calculated from GDP. It's a, it's a let's say, agricultural uh, index. So uh, to calculate this, you need to sum the the temperature from from uh, selecting date up to 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 uh, end of of uh, uh, this phenological phase in in uh, uh, related to the grape. So here you can see the uh, the observation of the uh, early vari varieties uh, this uh, rippling date, and then you can see from different uh, starting months like a February, May. March, April, May, and so on. You can see the forecast of that date, and we, the, the people who was interested in that was very satisfied, but didn't uh, show, let's say, uh, huge interest or, or uh, capacity to uh, to make this product to be to be operational. I will talk a little bit more about that uh, later. And also, we we use the seasonal forecast as a input. Uh, for crop modeling, also in our region, uh, here you can see some results. And but also it was more like an experimental uh, activity and, and not an operational one. Uh, also, one interesting activity related to the data collection and analysis of climate data in our region is a Carpet Clean project. Uh, so we, with the several partners in the region, developed the high-resolution gridded climatology for the for the region of of Car Carpathian Basin. And it's a 10 kilometer grid climatology. Uh, uh, also, uh, right now, the center and high met service here in Serbia host the website of uh, this uh, climate atlas. Uh, let's say so. Uh, it is interesting because it, it, it's on high resolution, and uh, right now, the, one of the main activities in climate modeling is to try to increase in resolution of, of regional climate models up to convective scales and this kind of data that can be useful for uh, verification of the models, but also on the other side, many uh, users from other different, uh, uh, let's say, sectors and uh, other institutions use this data for their analysis. For example, uh, we have uh, users which use this uh, high resolution data set for analysis of the forest or uh, the forest climatology or forest analysis uh, in the region. Uh, we're also doing a lot of uh, downscaling uh, of uh, climate projections. Uh, 
Uh, we use two models for downscaling. One is a hydrostatic disk couple system, the same couple system that we use for long range forecast, and another one is a high resolution NMMB non hydrostatic model. So, with this NMMB, we developed the 8 kilometer downscaling for the region uh, surrounding Serbia. It's not the, doesn't cover the whole Southeast European region, but, but cover, cover some part of, of, of that region. So, here is an example of this downscaling, it's a typical yeah. figures which represents uh, anomaly precipitation in the future for different time horizons. <clears throat> and also we use, we have a lot of uh, requests uh, for this data, so we cooperate uh, in several countries uh, to produce information which the governments use to, to prepare documents like the national communication from, uh, for UNFCCC or some kind of adaptation plans and things like that. And uh, also a lot of users in the region are interested to use this data for uh, input uh, on different impact studies like uh, water, res water resources or agriculture, forestry, biodiversity and things like that. So still People are more interested to, to, to use these downscaled uh, projections to, to perform some kind of impact study, but not so interested in using the, the, the product from long range forecast to produce some kind of operational analysis in their, in their uh, sectors. So, what are, what are the ba barriers that we faced uh, during these years in, in terms of uh, communicating with the different users in the region? So, first bullet here is that users outside the community often don't have experience in operational use of products. So, often from time to time, some of uh, potential users came to us asking for the data, but mainly they use the data for some uh, special case study or some short analysis, but they don't have sense how to use the data in operational mode, let's say, how to use the data every month, or they, they, they need to develop some operational system which will be continuously getting every seasonal forecast and then calculate what, what they need. Uh, then many users which approach us uh, uh, don't uh, understand the basic cost concepts, concepts related to this kind of, of forecast, like uh, they don't fully understand what ensemble means or what probabilistic forecast means. Also, sometimes it's hard to explain them about things like uh, model drift and bias. Also, the resolution sometimes is a problem because they always try to uh, approach us with a request for really super high resolution, like a few kilometers, and when they realize that we have the forecast on 25 kilometers, they think that that forecast is not, not uh, useful for their, their needs. Uh, also, we had the problems with the uh, users when we talk about the uh, data formats, so they are not familiar with the GRIB and Net, NetCDF. Mainly, they they asking for Excel files or they asking for some ArcGIS or something like that. So they they're mainly focused on more popular, let's say, format and not the formats which are common in in this community. Again, we have this in, in incompatibilities in the software, so we mainly use the, the things like a Fortran or R, but on the other side, many users asking for a Microsoft Excel they, to, to, to have data in Microsoft uh, Excel sheets, and also we all, often have a problem in the how to format that output data, because if you just into, introduce small change in the, in the data that you send to, to the users, they have a problem to to understand what happened or why it's not first to have that number and then another number and things like that. So mainly, it's sometimes, sometimes it's very hard to communicate this uh, organization of the data and how to, to exchange the data. Also, many users are more interested, interested in, der in derived products and not in the raw, raw model data. So if somebody from agric agriculture approaches, they are directly, directly asking us to have some uh, derived variables like a debt to GDD or some kind of index and don't, don't like to use the, the raw model data and, and to then do some calculations or, or something like that to, to, to have the benefit from that. And the, the last point is to hard uh, to, to get feedback from, from the users that use data. Okay, people from time to time get data, but it's very hard to understand the, are that data useful for them or that, does they do any kind of verification of, of the product and how they verify it, they uh, results using this data and, 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 and also we, we just don't have that kind of uh, 
permanent connection in terms to, to state the data and then to, to have some kind of, of feedback. Okay, that, that was my presentation. I would like, like to thank you also for your question. Uh, thanks a lot, Vladimir. Uh, that that was uh, very nice. And uh, um, I'd like to ask if uh, any of the, the attendants has any questions for uh, about your presentation. Uh, Janet? Uh, Janet? Yes. Um, well, I, I recognize a lot of what uh, Vladimir is saying. Uh, I, I have one question. Is that there that more uh, the users are generally interested, especially in derived products? Uh, that's that's something that I recognize too. Uh, are there sufficient people that can provide that? That uh, these derived products or organizations that can provide it. Unfortunately, there is no people who can provide products. From time to time, some of the people here start to work on, 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 on some problem, on try to develop something which can be uh, used directly by, by the user. But it's also a very, let's say, small scale project activity. It's not something that people are then dedicated to do that every month or things like that. So in that sense, yes, it's a problem to to maintain the activity because we are also not sure should we, let's say, push our government or uh, whatever who can who can uh, have some dedicated funds for this to tell them, okay, there is some need for some product, so, so we should have one more guy, salary for one more guy or for new group or something like that. So right now it's not clear how to, to, to do this. Should we... Uh, uh, make uh, arrangements here how to produce these dedicated products or, or should we try to <coughs> do that by them, them, themselves? Yes, and, and are there commercial providers, for example, who could do that in your country? No, the, the market no. of commercial products in, in this area of geoscience, let's say, or meteorology and uh, and climatology here is very small. We have just a few companies which are doing this kind of job, and they're mainly oriented to numerical weather prediction and uh, pr producing the products for TV or radio and things like that. Just one company does from time to time some kind of uh, high expertise co consultancy in area of meteorology and climate. But all other companies are just produce uh, everyday forecast for radio, TV, newspapers, and things like that. Okay, thanks, uh, Janet. Any more questions from your side? Yeah, for one more question. <laughs> um, um, well, you presented information for several countries. Do you really work together uh, with the neighboring countries for providing uh, information for the forecast, but also for the um, the longer time horizons for the, the future? Yeah, for, uh, with some countries we have and also with some countries we have some uh, special requests from, from the countries uh, within the southeast region related to the long range forecast. Like uh, Cyprus was very interesting in our product because they are a small island in the Mediterranean and the glo global uh, forecast system that, that doesn't show them as a uh, as an island, it's just see there. And also users from far east, like uh, Armenia and Georgia, ask, ask us to extend our domain because they're very interested in, in products to have for their uh, climate activities in that country. So in that sense, we, have, we don't have also permanent collaboration in the sense that we are 24 uh, seven online in communication with them, but we know each other in every time when, when some kind of uh, request uh, exists to produce something or to prepare some data for them, uh, we cooperate. Okay, thank you. Uh, any, any questions here in Barcelona? Dragana, you have a question. Uh, hello, Dragon, I'm speaking. 
Vladimir, you mentioned uh, some possible barriers with, uh, in communication with users. Is this from your personal experience or the center's experience, or is there any more formal study on user needs and, and these barriers in communication with users and what they need and what you can provide for this part of the Europe? Okay, no, it's it's more our experience as a as a, as a center as, as a whole, uh, let's say, group here. One of one of the source of experience was that archives because during the archives there is uh, also the session with the uh, forecast users, so people from let's say uh, 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 energy production companies or people who maintain the dams on the rivers or people from agriculture coming to the Arkov and there was like a four or five Arkovs in Belgrade, they come to Arkov so they are participate uh, in one part of the Arkov activity and that part is how they see what can be uh, benefits from this kind of forecast to them. So in that sense, we had a direct communication with the people on, this, uh, on these meetings, and we we'll learn a lot during these meetings what the people really need and how they uh, understand the seasonal forecast and things like that. But also another source of information is direct communication with potential users, from, because from time to time, the people find on the internet that somebody in the region produced the, this downscaling of long-range forecast, and try to approach us directly, not without any formal uh, meeting or I, I don't know how to say. And in that sense, we, we had really several very interesting uh, communication with, with the potential users, at, at, at least from uh, agriculture, forestry, and uh, water resources and things like that. We also uh, had a communication with people from insurance companies, but also, it's 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 uh, they're not ready to uh, invest uh, additional time to really how to say jump in, in the in this kind of, of job. To they just ask me what kind of product do we have? Can we translate that kind of product in some other format and things like that? But they're they are not ready to really they to invest their time to 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 really work on 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 that to 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 get some information they have so there is no any kind of uh, research or uh, formal uh document about this needs it's just our experience here and i i, I think we're we're in in this like a, for last six seven years so up to now we really have a lot of communication with different uh, uh, users let's say about your experience. Thank you. Uh, anybody else from here? Uh, just one quick question, Vladimir. Uh, it's Paco here. Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you have seasonal downscale data for for the uh, for Southeast Europe and uh, also climate projections. Uh, is there any uh, reason why? Uh, what you said happens, the, this fact that the people seem to prefer the climate projections uh, to, uh, in, 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 for, for their uh, applications than uh, uh, using seasonal predictions? Uh, no, it's just I, uh, people more understand uh, what, how to say, they, they are, their job is more related to assess the impact. I mean, for for, for potential users, and there, for them, it's much more easy. For from my point of view, it's much much more easy, easily to understand what climate projections means and what uh, that kind of long term uh, assessment of Im impact or risk uh, means uh, in comparison to to seasonal for forecast. For them, the seasonal forecast, from my point of view, is something like a I don't know something like a very experimental thing and uh, uh, when they start to talk with them about the per uh, percentiles or the this kind of kind of probabilistic uh, uh, products and things like that they they start to be confused especially when when you try to explain them the verification scores from the seasonal forecast and how to they need to 
understand also that part of civil workers when they are think that that is something really complicated and maybe to live for some other for some other time and when they need uh, something kind of risk assessment about the future the uh, especially that uh, thing of long term uh, uh, projections they are they are not so confused about that uh, what the products are and how to use them Okay, so somehow they are more familiar to climate projections because they have seen them uh, more often and also because they, they, they don't need to worry about the verification. Is that what you mean? Probably, yeah. Probably that, that's one of the reasons. So uh, I think it's uh, about time to uh, switch to Tom's uh, presentation. Uh, Tom, are you ready for for your presentation? Yeah, sure. Then I'll uh, give you the uh, presentation's rights. Okay, so you should be able to start any minute. All right, okay, can you see my screen? Yep, perfectly. Lovely, okay, great. So um, I'll, I, uh, it's quite interesting hearing Vladimir's talk there. Uh, there's lots of issues that he raised that are definitely um, uh, applicable here, uh, even though I'm sitting on the other side of the fence, effectively, and, and I'm a consumer of this data. So um, I'm going to take a chance to show you, I think, how climate data information is used uh, currently in the insurance industry, and to try and give you a snapshot of where we are as an industry in terms of what data we do use, what data we can use, and what data we really can't. Um, so just a, a bit of background before I start, um, I, uh, I joined XR Catlin three years ago after finishing my PhD in meteorology at Reading University. Um, and I joined as a science analyst, so trying to uh, help pour in some of, uh, well, a lot of this climate data into how we go about uh, making decisions. Um, so XO Catlin, uh, for those who don't know, is um, a global insurer and reinsurer um, and we're the biggest presence at uh, Lloyd's uh, in, and in the London market. Um, and the Lloyd's market there being particularly uh, sort of specialist. So we, we uh, tend to look at uh, sort of catastrophic type perils um, very closely. Um, so before I give you a um, a sort of rundown of how we're using data within the whole industry. I think it's it's probably useful to break out how uh, how the industry is actually structured in terms of its actors. Um, so uh, on a basic level, uh, we have insurers and reinsurers. Uh, so for anyone that doesn't know the difference there, uh, reinsurers being um, insurance for insurers. And so they're designed really to take away catastrophic type risk from insurers. So insurers being, I guess you'd call it attritional uh, losses and then reinsurers uh, taking the big um, volatility out of that. Um, and then within the insurers and reinsurers, you have uh, different uh, types of people and with different levels of expertise. So you have underwriters who are ultimately responsible for writing a risk, uh, actuaries who, uh, fundamentally price the risk in the first place. And then you tend to have in, in every insurer and reinsurer com communications teams that are responsible for projecting out uh, what the company does and, uh, and what we understand about the risk. Um, and then uh, on a different level, you have brokers who act as sort of a middleman between clients and insurers. And they're effectively salesmen largely, uh, but they have a, they tend to have a lot of expertise in-house because they uh, offer a lot of advice to the clients on what is a good price to, to be insuring or what is an appropriate price to ask. Um, and then we have uh, catastrophe modelers. So this is a, it's almost a sub-industry within insurance now uh, and that will apply to any sort of financial industry uh, came out of um, some big losses in the late 80s and early 90s and people realizing that we needed to um, re or rethink how we looked at uh, or how we represented uh, really catastrophic uh, losses uh, because nobody really 
had appreciated how big some of these losses could be. Hurricane Andrew, be, Andrew being the big driver of of why uh, the Katashi modeling industry has grown up. And then on a final sort of uh, uh, overview level there, you've got regulators who are responsible for assessing the methods uh, that produce the ultimate uh, financial losses and to make sure that the industry is adequately protected by using their methods in appropriate ways. So you have all of those different uh, actors and each of them have very different levels of expertise. So catastrophe models are modelers are exceptionally close to the science, really, and so they it's, it, they're largely the, certainly the scientists within it um, are not much different from an academic department. Um, and then within insurers and reinsurers, you sometimes and brokers, you sometimes have scientists that uh, that are at a, a similar level. But when you start coming down towards the actuaries who are much more just uh, mathematical and, and purely statistical and don't necessarily understand the uh, the uncertainty or uh, what's appropriate to use some of the scientific data uh, for. Um, and then the underwriters who uh, yeah have to try and take a much broader view of everything. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of variation in, in expertise. And it can it can go from a complete layman to um, absolutely someone who understands the science uh, inside out. Um, and then before I, I move on as well, I think one thing to to also note is is insurance is usually broken down into uh, life and non-life insurance, um, and we are predominantly a non-life insurer. Uh, and life insurance here means uh, effectively it's ju it's just death, pensions, and annuities really. So anything that is really to do with climate it actually falls into non-life largely. Um, non-life actually um, sort of, yeah, not intuitively includes accident and health insurance. Um, so uh, it's, it's purely this that I'll be talking about from that perspective. Um, so with that in mind, um, and obviously being from an insurer and reinsurer, I'm going to talk about the sort of chain of information, how it's used from the original scientific data and how it gets to a decision. Um, and I'm going to focus for the first part on historical data because that's really um, the fundamental thing that we use here. Uh, I'll go on to projections and predictions uh, towards the end of the presentation, but the, the biggest thing we do use is, is historical data. So I'll start with the uh, the actuarial side, uh, the non-catastrophe model side of the, this uh, slide first. So you might, you might take your, um, uh, if we say we're talking about flood, you might talk, take your flood frequency maps from a scientific perspective uh, using things like the underlying hydrology, but then using precipitation return periods or something like that. Uh, it, combine it with exposure information, which is, um, the sort of information of the the, the uh, thing that you're actually insuring, and then the insurance policy terms, and then combine that with uh, what you've seen in terms of loss data from history. Combine them all together, and then get a loss estimate out, and then start start feeding that back within uh, experts that you might bring in uh, to, to discuss with you, within site with scientists that you might have in house, and even with underwriters who obviously have a lot of experience in in writing these risks and, and seeing these things in history. And you start iteratively um, refining that pricing model until you get a loss estimate that you feel is reflective of um, of reality, and then you do, then ultimately an underwriter has to make a decision as to whether he'll uh, write a risk or not. Um, so that's from a basic pricing perspective and historically how insurance was done. Um, and then, as I mentioned in the early 90s, a catastrophe modeling uh, grew up, and it, it's sort of a more sophisticated view of that uh, that actuarial pricing model, really. And what it does is use a lot more uh, scientific methods to to get uh, your ultimate loss estimate. So you might take your historical frequency or intensity data um, for, for certain um, perils, uh, or you might take output from a reanalysis, for example, and then downscale it. Um, and usually, uh, this is a big thing, as, as uh, Vladimir mentioned, uh, usually within this catastrophe modeling industry, there'll be dynamical up to a level, and then there will be statistical as well, downscaling. 
and then there might be a lot of conversion which might just be simply uh, extrapolating or interpolating onto a grid that's appropriate and then uh, run uh, for a large number of simulations um, so that you get a stochastic hazard set out of the end of it and then they're combined with your exposure information just like on the actuarial side but um, but then co also combined with vulnerability functions that tell you effectively how how vulnerable the buildings are to um, the hazard itself and then combined ultimately with damage to loss ratios which sort of fall in between the vulnerability and financial modeling part and then the financial modeling you get a loss at, uh, estimate out um, and a, a big thing actually there is that there's a lot of calibration and validation that's done with a lot, of things. a lot of adjusting is done once they get the first loss estimate out in order to make it um, uh, reflective of what's happened in history. Um, and then those, those things are either fed directly into an underwriting decision or occasionally back into underwriters who then uh, make a decision out of it. Um, so that's the sort of chain from a historical perspective. Um, and one of the, I think one of the biggest issues here um, and one of the real needs for us as an industry uh, from science at the moment is, is to really start looking at this part of the catastrophe modeling chain. Um, so when we have the downscaling side through the extrapolation and interpolation through to the stochastic modeling there are no it's not peer-reviewed at all this this part of the um, chain uh, it's it's a really uh, difficult thing uh, for an insurer and reinsurer to get a hold of uh, because we we have to rely on the catastrophe modeling companies to give us enough information um, but the problem is that they see it as their intellectual property and and therefore uh, Largely, they 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 tell they they certainly do publish a lot uh, to us, not to the wider world, and not certainly not to the public. Um, but we get to see a lot of their methods. Um, but without being an expert in a certain peril or a certain part of this chain, it's 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 almost impossible to say whether the methods are appropriate at all um, for any part of that chain. So I think what from the, if I just take the downscaling side, um, uh, given that Vladimir mentioned that, and I thought it was very interesting, the, obviously a lot of scientific output will be given at the appropriate resolution from the model, and, and it won't be given at a finer, finer resolution because it, it wouldn't be appropriate to do that, and, it, and you would give you a skewed view of reality. But at the same time, just like Vladimir pointed out, somebody in this chain is doing that is going to do that. And so almost we need from scientists at the moment, and uh, not only sort of a standard of this is the limit of the, the uh, resolution you can get, but we need um, strict methods or strict notes on what methods are appropriate to downscale and if, they, if things should be downscaled at any, any further. Um, and if if not, then how much uncertainty you're introducing, and how you know, how wrong your view could ultimately be by using certain methods. Um, ultimately, because of the vulnerability set afterwards, we need it at extremely, or catastrophe modelers need it at extremely high resolution. So um, yeah, it, it, it's a really really big problem, um, and we need to we need to sort of expand this out into a, a big discussion between scientists and the insurance industry as a whole but as I said it's sort of black box at the moment because uh, the catastrophe modeling companies have to regard this as intellectual property um, but that's changing slowly um, and it's changing because of this sort of pushed uh, from a number of um, regulators from a lot of insurers and reinsurers towards trying to get to a point where we can do open source modeling and the thing that's changing that a lot is the sort of rise of OASIS. So OASIS is a loss modeling framework, and the idea of it was that it was effectively just going to be purely open source, and what it would provide is the platform to uh, uh, put in the different um, things that, uh, that you'd need, but also then provide the final financial modeling step so that you get your ultimate loss estimate out. So obviously the exposure information um, sits w within the insurers, so that's not a problem. We get them 
Oasis will provide the financial modeling uh, side. And there's lots of academic um, hazard sets that either have been um, used to turn them into stochastic hazard sets or that could very easily be turned into stochastic hazard sets. But um, although we've got that, and, and I think a lot of people think that OASIS and open source modeling is, is almost is here now and could be used now, actually there's, there's a big issue in that um, the vulnerability side just isn't tied up to the academic hazard side. Um, and largely, I, I would have to say, it seems to me that it's, it's because um, this, although in the industry, those engineers and people that would produce the vulnerability functions are very closely tied into, within catastrophe modeling companies, very closely tied into the scientists. Within academia, there's still, that's still not the case, and so you don't get vulnerability functions that are applicable to certain hazard sets. Um, and then on another level to that, you actually then, you, we obviously don't have any calibration and validation side. So I think this is a really big issue that we need to address um, and it needs to be addressed very soon in order to uh, actually allow open source modeling to be a thing in the future. Um, so that's, the, that's from a historical perspective and I guess where the industry is now. Um, and then I thought uh, it would be useful for us to talk about the, what the prediction and projection side of it is from a, an insurance industry perspective. Um, and given what we have really, what the call is really about, I thought I'd just focus, because I could talk about this um, for hours, um, but I thought I'd just focus on just the barriers to entry for predictions and projections, because largely they're not used within insurance, um, within the insurance industry. Um, and the reasons are, the first one, um, really obviously insurance is focused on, on, the, on perils that cause big losses. And so you're looking at things like hurricanes, tornado, European windstorm, hail, and the um, uncertainty in the predictions and, uh, and forecasts of those perils at um, annual or longer um, timescales is just massive. Um, and so uh, I, I, they're just the really things that we haven't learned, I guess, how to take the uh, take the output of some of those projections with the amount of uncertainty that exists on them and actually translate that through into a product. And I think there's something definitely there. There's lots of um, interest uh, from the underwriting community in it to be able to do that nobody has managed to do that yet. So it, 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 I think that one is going to take a lot of discussion between science and between industry to get people to a level where it might turn into something useful for us. Um, another one is that actually the, obviously, uh, the scientific community doesn't necessarily uh, take into account uh, the sort of timeline of how insurance is written. So. Um, particularly from a reinsurance perspective, um, there's renewal dates for the insurance market and that they occur on the 1st of January, 1st of April, 1st of July and 1st of October. And they tend to be sort of skewed uh, on a global level towards the 1st of January and then it sort of tails off a bit. So having predictions of the biggest climate perils, for example, hurricane that would occur you know, a few weeks before the 1st of January, for the upcoming season, if there was skill in that, that might ha that might start to have a big influence on um, on how underwriters look at the risk before the upcoming year. Um, but then, having said that, there's also regional variation depending on the type of peril you're writing. And if you're writing it for US, it's like as I mentioned, it's the 1st of January. But if you're looking at the Asia Pacific region, um, renewal dates are actually skewed towards 1st of April. So for typhoon. Um, or a, any other peril, uh, climate peril that's affecting uh, the Asia Pacific, you might want those predictions made at, uh, just before the 1st of April. Um, and yeah, and, and as I mentioned, this, it, it's also skewed by, the, by what uh, insurance and reinsurance need. And I think there's a need for a discussion there. Um, the third point. Um, is that the climate projections are, are made at um, timescales that don't necessarily fit um, insurance contracts or traditional reinsurance business plans. So from this side, I'm, I'm really talking about um, climate change project projections. Um, 
is obviously when we're talking about ENSA or anything like that, it's, it's a bit different, but um, a lot is being made of, of how we're trying to capture climate change information and how we're trying to uh, account for that in, in our view of future uh, losses. And it's, it's an exceptionally difficult thing to do because, um, as you'll all be aware, we have the choice of writing a risk every year. So uh, if suddenly the risk increases to a, beyond a certain level, uh, it only takes us a year to come off that uh, risk. Um, so we, we, and then if you're thinking of a, a longer term business plan for an insurer or reinsurer, really we're only probably looking out to five to ten years um, because once you get past that level it becomes, it starts to become very abstract and uncertain. So when we're looking at climate change projections that are typically made by the scientific community for out to either 2100 or even those closer 2050 or 2030, um, they're still too abstract for us to use. So. Uh, there's a lot, I think, that could be made um, more applicable to us by looking at what, given that we're, we're looking at historical hazard data sets that might be over the last between 30 and 100 years that uh, gives us our view of the risk in the in the next year, um, how you would go about adding a climate change impact into that for your view of the next year is, uh, is something we, we need to discuss and, yeah, bring science uh, into our view a lot more. Um, and then as a final point, again, uh, making this resolutions um, question another thing. So the, I think this is, although you've got the, the pure resolution issue, um, you've got the, the sort of peril issue. A lot of the climate change projections are made with just generic temperature, surface pressure, precipitation, uh, how they change. But um, a lot less, obviously because of the amount of uncertainty is on it, is actually made on those perils um, that um, that really impact us as an industry. So trying to constrain some of that and actually make it applicable is, is another big thing. Um, so those, I think, are the main barriers to entry at the moment. Um, and then I thought I would just largely just try to summarize uh, where we're at as an in industry uh, in terms of where our focus uh, is chiefly on. Um, and where you would likely have the biggest impact from the research. So currently, um, when we're looking at the non-life insurance, the premium distribution around the world is obviously, you can see on the left, they're heavily skewed towards Western Europe and North America. So it makes up um, just over 50% there. Um, and then it, it sort of drops off. Um, but the, I think one of the sort of big things here to take away is although it's skewed towards Western Europe and North America, the catastrophe modeling industry is largely built up almost purely around that. And the competition and the amount of sophistication in some of those models now is, is so high that, um, that it's very difficult to get an edge there. Um, but if you look at uh, certain places, certainly like emerging um, Asia, where if you look at the, on the right there, it, it, it's already taking up 10% of the premiums, total premiums, but it's also growing at an extremely rapid rate. And a lot of the focus of insurers and reinsurers now is, is on these emerging markets where it actually might be a, a um, much easier place uh, to get a bigger return um, on your investment and time uh, for research. So. I think there's, there's, there's beginning to be a shift in insurers' views um, to other regions, and, and I think a lot of science could go a long way um, in those regions, certainly in emerging Asia and Africa and even South America as well. Um, so just to summarize uh, there what I've said, uh, the, the main point. So historical climate data is, is obviously widely used, and it's fundamental to how we build our view of risk. Uh, but there's many different actors um, within the chain of using that data, and they all have varying levels of, of technical expertise. And I think it, it, it's really necessary that we, although we get exactly the type of information we need about what's appropriate to do with the data and, and what you can and can't do, what you should and shouldn't do, uh, it also needs to be given at a very generic level um, as well that almost a layman could understand. And needs to be variations within how how that climate data is presented. Um, obviously, the, the standards and peer review is a sort of follow-on to that. It's sorely needed um, in that catastrophe modeling chain. And uh, without them, I think there's, 
as you can probably tell from what I'm saying, I think there's there's a lot of uh, steps within that Katashi modeling chain that are actually completely inappropriate, um, and that scientists, I'm sure, would not want their uh, would not want to see their data being used in in those ways. Um, but they are, and so they are, and they almost have to be because, as Vladimir pointed out, we it's got to a point where we feel we need the, re the data at, that, at those resolutions. Um, so we, somebody will be doing that. If, if scientists refuse to do it, somebody will do it along that chain. And that's what Katashi modelers are doing at the moment. And we need a bit more open discussion and conversation about what is and, not, what is and isn't appropriate. Um, and then, although uh, open source modelling exists um, on the horizon, uh, we still, I think, need uh, a lot more sort of joined up thinking between engineers and scientists if we're going to see open source modeling uh, actually be widely taken up within the industry. Um, and then uh, from the climate prediction projection side, um, it's, yeah, we, we, it's, almost a, it's almost not used at the moment just because of the various barriers that I've presented and uh, what insurance would want and what currently is produced by um, current scientific practice. Um, and the, uh, yeah, the final point, although um, the sort of current worldwide insurance market is heavily skewed towards North America and Western Europe, uh, the emerging markets of Asia and Africa um, and South America are growing very rapidly and a lot of focus is turning towards those. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. Thanks a lot, Sam. Uh, very interesting, the, in the, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that there will be some uh, uh, some questions uh, arising from here. Uh, shall we start from uh, the uh, the, uh, the attendants? Uh, Janet, War, Carlo, do you, do you have any questions? Yeah. Yes, I do have some questions. Can I start? Sure. Please go ahead. Yeah, 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 okay. Um, well, I have several questions, but I'll start with one. Uh, you said especially historical data are used, but um, which historical data do you use, especially point data, reanalysis, uh, radar data, for example, for precipitation, satellite data? It's completely dependent on the peril, uh, and very widely. So, um, if you're looking at uh, North Atlantic hurricane, the biggest uh, thing that goes into those catastrophe models are frequency uh, and intensity. So uh, from HERDAP, um, uh, the, yeah, the, the hurricane database. Um, if you're looking at European windstorm, obviously there isn't anything equivalent. So you, the, uh, those are typically taken from uh, tracking in reanalysis data. Uh, if you're taking, uh, if you're looking at flood and precipitation, even from things like uh, precipitation is a big part of the typhoon models. Uh, you're looking at yes, satellite data, um, uh, sort of the TRMM uh, product. Um, uh, so it's it's completely dependent um, on on which peril you're looking at and exactly what you what you believe your exposure is most uh, vulnerable to. So with Atlantic Hurricane, the flood side really isn't. Uh, isn't considered too much in terms of from a precipitation perspective. It certainly is from a storm surge perspective. So, uh, yeah, it, it varies widely. But the but this so within catastrophe modeling um, and the catastrophe modeling companies, they certainly understand all of the uh, intricacies of the data and, and it from a purely scientific perspective. But once you move away from them and you move towards the insurers and reinsurers and the actuaries and underwriters. You, you tend to see them focus almost purely on frequency and intensity of those perils. Um, yeah, so it's, although, the, although a, lot of, a lot of data, a lot of pure scientific data from radar, satellite, and everything comes out and is, is passed into that view, perhaps from catastrophe modelers, um, it, it's taken at a much more basic level of sort of frequency and intensity by the time it gets into reinsurers and insurers. Uh, and uh, another question relates to catas catastrophe modeling. Uh, I guess they use a lot of uh, impact models. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. And 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 um, it, it, what do you think is is the, the available information for impact modeling 
the, the models use? Is, is that a, a bigger limitation than the climate data available, or? Sorry, so what do you mean? To, um, when you're saying impact models, do you mean the what what um, the actual? So effectively, what how you calculate the damage from the? Yes. Uh huh. So I think that that side of it is is absolutely massive, and um, and and what's interesting is that the a lot of the so a lot of my job here is 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 I spend a lot of my time doing validation of some of the catastrophe models, but because my background is in the hazard side, I, it's from a hazard perspective, and there's a there's a much smaller I would say a group of uh, scientists and engineers that are concerned with the vulnerability side. Um, and although that's now being, it's, it's sort of a conversation that's progressing uh, within the industry, it's still not taken as seriously. So the, so understanding that what exactly how much uncertainty uh, there is in that from the hazard to the damage, uh, both from the vulnerability function side and then from the damage to loss ratios, I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty there and uh, we need a big open conversation about it. But uh, I think a lot of people are quite scared to have that conversation. Uh, yeah, there's huge amounts of uncertainty in it. Uh, but I, I also feel that, the, that there's a disconnect between academia there. I, for example, um, uh, there's a, 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 a university in London that's, that's expertise in both um, hazard and vulnerability. Um, and it's sort of taken two separate conversations with two different departments to uh, to start thinking about the whole chain here, um, and two different departments that don't interact within the university, but interact when they come and talk to us. So I, I think there's there's some sort of invisible barrier there that from a yeah that needs to be tied up. Certainly, when you're looking at, at from our perspective. Okay, thank you. Can I ask another question? Yes, please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, you said that uh, climate projections and predictions are, are only used, uh, well, they're used very little. Um, how do you use uh, climate predictions? Is, is it just to uh, see what could happen in the near future, or do you also use that information in a different way? Yeah. For example, for, 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 for getting a better idea of the... Um, the natural variability and therefore the the frequency of extreme events. Yeah. So so yeah. So that that perfectly ties into sort of the El Nino. Uh, El Nino is possibly the biggest one that the industry looks at uh, because it's it's sort of predictable. It has it has there's some uh, yeah it, it, fairly predictable. Um, but then obviously you have to have a look at uh, the impact on what that means to predict prediction of extreme events. Uh, so it is something that. Uh, the, the insurance industry is certainly aware of, but how it's actually used in terms of changing decision making, um, I'm really, I really don't think it's 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 there at the moment. Um, it's it's a really difficult one, like having to trying to convey the amount of uncertainty to some of the underwriters and decision makers in the company. Um, yeah, effectively, how confident we can be that it's an El Nino year, and therefore how much you're risk changes and obviously when you, you, there's there's extra things to think of when you obviously there's some strong correlation between a drop in um atlantic hurricane activity overall and el nino um but at the same time there's not there's not as big a drop in the correlation between um insured risk like when you look through history insured risk and el nino in the US from atlantic hurricane so it's sort of like the, the, the small data set to start with, and you're making it smaller when you're just looking at the sort of coastline and the impact on the coastline of the U.S. Um, so it's, it's just one of those things that I think the industry as a whole hasn't hasn't really worked out, and and certainly for the other sort of oscillations that are involved and can cause impacts on natural variability, I think most of the time they would be just considered far too uncertain to be to have any practical use. Obviously, most of them are extremely unpredictable. Um, so I think that there's something certainly in there that um, that should be, in, I think, could be used in the future by the industry. But uh, it's going to take a big conversation about how uh, 
largely from the scientists right down to the underwriters to what the uncertainty means and how it could be used to almost hedge your bets, I guess, um, in certain years when we do see the hazard uh, increase or decrease. But, but then you, you use it mainly as a source of um, forecast, a prediction. What I uh, can also imagine that what, the, the, the skill is rather low in certain regions of the world. For El Nino, in certain regions, it's what well, it has some predictive skill. But if you just look back at the, for example, the ensembles for the forecast and the uh, climate predictions, you could also use it to get a better um, description of the natural variability in the current climate. Yeah. Wouldn't that be an, an, an application? So not for forecasts, but for uh, uh, better quantifying the, uh, the natural variability and the, the, the possible frequency of, uh, of extreme events. Yeah, I mean, I guess in, in, in most ways that is taken into account in terms of how you go about uh, thinking about the distribution of events that occurs in an average year. So looking at, yeah, effectively what the... If uh, like the models effectively don't assume that events are random, and they, you know they certainly take into account if hurricanes seem to occur in a more clustered pattern in a single year, and then you can start. Yeah, you can. Yeah. So I think from that perspective, yeah, they, it certainly is taken into account already. Um, but uh, and it's it's just yeah, it's a very difficult thing. I think from a prediction. I, I try to focus on prediction, I think, because I think there's a, a good view of the of the variability that is taken into account from the stochastic modeling already, um, and then you're looking at perhaps over dispersion of events and and what that how that changes your average annual loss or your yeah your, your return period curves of loss. Um, but there's a bigger question to do with I guess how you would then translate certain years going forward. Uh, that might have certain phases of oscillations, uh, but so if I take that, if you take the North Atlantic hurricane uh, peril, um, there's the views of that have have tried to incorporate, I think, some of these ideas that you you could subset your history um, and then uh, for certain uh, oscillations or certain climate factors that might have impacted the frequency and intensity in certain years and then run the model forward for or run different models effectively uh, to see what your frequency and intensity might be during those years um, and then try and get a combined view of what's the most appropriate level of risk and so th there is I guess some sophistication there of, of looking back at history to get to capture the climate variability but even even with that, I think there's there's a huge amount of uncertainty in in doing that, and possibly um, actually a lack of understanding that uh, isn't necessarily conveyed very well. Um, so it's almost I would I would almost say sometimes the science oversteps its mark in terms of uh, how reliable it, it really is looking forward. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any questions from uh, any other of the remote uh, attendants? No, uh, then uh, any questions from here? Uh, anyone here at the, in Barcelona? Uh, Omar? Yeah, I would be interested to know if there's any interest uh, in the internet sector from uh, knowing what the human role was on past extreme events. So if there's any use to uh, from attribution statements on extreme events that have passed. Uh, I think in, on certain level there is. I don't. I don't. Or yeah, there's two things coming out of that. I think firstly that definitely is in terms of your overall climate change perspective, um, and that that's fundamentally where they where the interest lies. Um, just capturing whether yeah, whether it's human cause or not. Um, Capturing what climate change is doing to the view to what to perils really, but there's a second thing actually in terms of if you want if you're looking purely at capturing what the human impact is, 
And I, I, don't, I don't know for sure, but there's certainly um, in discussions I've overheard at, at Lloyd's and um, presentations, there um, there is some sort of concern, I guess, that you, you could almost have liability insurance arising out of this if you can quantify the impact of, of human-caused climate change. Obviously, you'd have to have the first step and, and see what climate change has done in the first place and then go on to quantify the human side of that. You might actually see that certain governments or certain companies are, um, have been liable for causing certain things, and, and then you might end up having liability claims off that. Um, so there might be, uh, but I, I think that the focus should really be on trying to capture um, what impact climate change just as a whole without trying to attribute a uh, human cause or not, um, how it's actually impacting uh, perils that affect the industry. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. And uh, one last question before we close, because we, uh, well, we, we have only booked the, the room for until until 12. Uh, someone else? Okay. Yeah, Ray Philippe. Hey, Tom. Um, quick, quick question. You, said you mentioned that one of the limitations uh, regarding climate projection was resolution. Um, how high of a resolution would you need to actually be uh, to make use of these climate projection? Yeah, so uh, that's a difficult one as well. But I, um, I, you know, you're looking, I think, for the, when you're looking, obviously, when, you, when you're trying to convert through to a vulnerability side and you're looking at building damage, you're, you're, you're looking so high resolution, you're looking at individual damage to, to certain buildings. And I would say that catastrophe modeling at the moment, you know, goes to, it downscales things from, Reanalysis resolution, you know, up to one kilometer, perhaps resolution, um, and obviously part of that will be down, dynamical downscaling, and then the rest will be statistical once you get to a level of dynamical that you can't go any further, um, or would be too expensive to go further. So, um, yeah, I think I think that this is the, this is one of the biggest issues, largely, that the that the catastrophe modeling industry has goes from these very coarse resolutions to extremely high resolutions. And they're, they're resolutions that you know scientists would say you can't do that with with this data, um, and yet they do. So so once you get like if you if you're taking that say reanalysis data, you get to your one kilometer downscale data, then you go then you take a different perspective and you take site specific wind observations and you you try and relate that back to your one kilometer downscaled and and then try and and work out what the relationship is. Um, yeah, so to make it useful, I would say you'd have to get to those resolutions. And if you can't get to those resolutions, the 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 reasoning as to why you can't, how much uncertainty it introduces, need to be made really explicit and as and written as a warning, and that you know those type of methods aren't appropriate because they're certainly being used at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm afraid that we have to stop it here uh, because we uh, we can't carry on uh, with the uh, with the session. Uh, thanks very much for all the people attending, uh, and especially to uh, to Vladimir and Tom. Um, apologies again for the um, uh, massive delay at the beginning, and uh, uh, it's a it's a bit of a pity that we couldn't. Uh, uh, go through the, uh, the uh, list of questions, which uh, well eventually uh, we'll we'll do it the the next webinar. Uh, I invite you to attend the next webinar, or uh, in uh, if you can't, uh, don't forget to go to the Climate Europe website where you'll find all the information, including the recordings. Thanks very much, and uh, happy Christmas to all of you. If I don't talk to you again uh, in the next few days. <laughs>